Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about countries around the world investing in U.S. investment in wars. We have three guests joining us from Mauritius. Nasheen Utin is a certified project manager and accountant. Zainab Kodobakus is a chemical and renewable energy engineer, and Adil Abubakar is a chartered financial analyst and managing founder of a consultancy firm focused on financial modeling and business valuation. Welcome, everyone, to Talk World Radio. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us, David. Thank you. So uh, I don't know who wants to start, but... How do other countries or other governments uh, fund U.S. war making? All right. Uh, if you let me, uh, if you allow me, let me uh, just drop in a quick introduction. Uh, firstly, David, thank you for having us. We, we really appreciate it. Now, we've been talking about this for a month uh, since December 2023. And uh, what we'll talk about is very obvious in a sense, but at the same time, We've scarcely seen anyone raise the subject. And uh, I'd like to clarify for the audience that what we're sharing here are our personal views and uh, also personal actions. And our aim is to raise awareness, uh, it's actually duty. And at the same time, uh, we find it very perplexing that generally it seems uh, we have little control over how our money is invested and or we leave under, uh, we leave under that impression and we kind of uh, have accepted it when it should not be the case. And today we're going to talk about U.S. treasuries, uh, which are actually the safest investments in the world. And um, so I'll j jump right into the topic. And uh, we've written about it. We've uh, posted uh, videos about it on social media. We've uh, talked extensively about it. And um, so we're just highlighting what we're calling a big disconnect. Now, U.S. treasuries, people could be very familiar with it, people who, well, We've actually uh, discussed this topic with audience across the spectrum from people who did not know what they are to people who actually know what US treasuries are and actually deal in them. And uh, just to get everyone at heart, it's one of the safest investments in the world. It's simply the sovereign bond of bills and notes issued by the US federal government. And I'd say federal to uh, highlight the fact that it's at federal level that these bonds are issued. And they're also very liquid, uh, highly uh, marketable, highly tradable. And uh, so you'll find uh, banks, central banks and uh, insurance companies, pension funds, fund managers, also other asset managers who invest heavily in U.S. treasuries. Now, it's um, one of the most common uh, investment you can have. But at the same time, it um, actually serves a very important part of the fiscal management of the U.S government. And when we look at the what we call the fiscal deficit, so um, taxation or other government revenues being short of the expenditures of the US government, the remainder is actually funded by debt. And it's very common. I mean, I think most people would be familiar with that. Now, the US government has uh, actually access to the debt market uh, quite uh, easily and uh, being the safest investments in the world, uh, not just US-based uh, investors, but also investors all over the world purchase US treasuries. And um, since the, well, uh, since December, 2023, we've uh, started looking at the data, which is uh, publicly available. Everything we talk about here is actually based on data, which is accessible to anyone. And we started looking at how uh, the US government was using these funds. And obviously, uh, to fill that budget, uh, part funded by taxation and part funded by debt, um, we look at uh, how the spending is done. And you go on the official government website and you see different expenditure lines, healthcare, other infrastructures, other programs, but also including defense and military and assistance to. Uh, foreign countries, right, including uh, other friendly countries who are plausibly committing genocide. Now, at the same time, we hear the American taxpayers complaining 
um, that their funds are being misused. And, uh, but there's a silence, a, a very perplexing silence from the dead side, because from the latest figure, from the first semester, so ending March 2024, the first semester, the total expenditures uh, by the US government was funded 67% by revenue generated by that government, and the remainder was funded by debt. And uh, debt not only from the US, but debt from around the world, right? And uh, when we look at um, October to December 2023, that was the first fiscal quarter of uh, 2024, we wanted to know, well, how much US treasuries were purchased by the rest of the world? Because it's a data that we wanted to um, understand. And we started plotting some charts and plotting some graphs and looking at some trends. And actually in those, uh, so from, actually would, would uh, take it up to February 20, 2024, because we have data for, for them. So from October, 2023 to February, 2024, $361 billion of US treasuries were bought by the rest of the world, by uh, non-US holders. Now. Everything is, I mean, at, at this point in time, nothing sounds too, um, how to say that, too shocking. But when we look at October, that period when the war um, in Gaza or the assault on the civilian population in Gaza started early October, and uh, in that very month, the UN held a ceasefire resolution, the first one, ES 10 slash 21, where 121 countries voted for ceasefire. And out of these 121 countries, 36 countries actually uh, not only hold US treasuries, but they purchase US treasuries in those uh, five months, or, or let's uh, focus on the three months. So October, uh, November, December. They bought a total of, I will give you the right figure so I don't actually mislead anyone. So, ceasefire countries. I wonder so in that three months, if we could let Zainab or Nashin get a word in here as well and discuss <laughs> what are we, are we talking about foreign governments or individuals and businesses in foreign countries? Uh, who is it that's loaning all of this money to the United States and why are they doing it? Absolutely. Okay. Let me jump in. So, David, in previous contracts, US paid for the wars as part of its defense budget, uh, mainly through a mixture of higher taxes and budget costs. But now we are in an era of free flowing international capital markets. We could see the trend has changed. Instead of raising taxes, the US is borrowing more, more from the rest of the world. Why? Because it's easy to borrow a large amount of money that are negatively affecting the cost of capital. So what we have seen, what we have observed since the context started uh, in Gaza, we have seen an increase in the issuance of US treasuries. The figures I have, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Abu, um, the 36 countries actually purchased 144 billion USD during that period. So this clearly shows the link between the issuance of US treasuries and what's happening in Gaza. Because if we look at the US government capacity to raise funds internally, it's not enough. It's running on a deficit. So how then the war is being funded? Because we all know waging war is costly. You can deplete your, your resources, but at the end of the day, you need, you need money. So where is the government getting that money? Through publicly available data, we could see that it's being funded the issuance of US treasuries. So that's the, the link we would like to highlight. And now to answer your question, who invests in that US treasury? So like I mentioned, it's a free-flowing international capital market. So it could be me, it could be other, it could be Zainab, investing in that US treasuries through our pension company or through our taxes. So this is why now we want to create that awareness raising this concern so that all people like us who are calling with ceasefire, we want their focus to be on the funding. We know money gives you power. 
And if you close it up, then we can control everything. Zainab, it seems like there is growing awareness ar around the world and in, and in the United States about divestment from Israel. Let's not give money to Israel for Israeli war yeah. crimes. Uh, but the same countries that are voting for a ceasefire in Israel are loaning piles of money to the U.S. government, and the Israeli government expects shiploads of free weapons from the U.S. government. And if they don't get them, they accuse U.S. politicians of loving Hamas. Uh, so why why is there no boycott or divestment from the U.S. government, uh, which is behind the Israeli war? It's, it's uh, actually the question I ask myself, because, um, you know, for me, um, and I think for all of us here, uh, awareness is the first step. It's actually uh, what, when people are informed, they can come together to find solutions. And I think this is what World Beyond War is trying to do. Um, the world, as you rightly mentioned today, has a problem with where money is going, the financial flows. We try to look at that. And it's part also of my expertise and, uh, you know, to look at uh, socially responsible investing. So today, when Adil is talking about U.S. Treasury and uh, from uh, what Noshin said, it's about where who, whoever can, can actually invest in those. But once we create awareness that U.S. needs those countries, and as you rightly said, Israel is not stopping and cannot, uh, it's not stopping the war. And um, in fact, if you try to stop or boycott your pro, uh, you call a terrorist, I've got that, I think many of us did. But then if people are informed, we can try to find solutions. You know, today we call for accountability. We talk about supply chain transparency. And uh, I think when we see the world, uh, universities, the campus students, and the, the, all the protests coming together to call for boycott, for divestment, for sanctions. I think the, the, the idea behind is that we are aware of the frameworks. You know, there's the ILO conventions that our global leaders voted for. There's the UN guiding principles for businesses and human rights. I think uh, we, we're looking at the right uh, place, but it's just that there is, a, there is a slowdown in terms of taking steps. And there must be a limiting factor because today um, these whole movements, the whole protest that we see is probably because the very same standards that those countries set and the frameworks that those, they set to call for these war crimes, for these injustice. So I think while we can be called pro Hamas or uh, we cannot stop Israel, US cannot stop Israel today, but we have to keep talking about it. We have to keep supporting movements that are looking at the supply chain of those weapons uh, manufacturers and try to stop that. Because as Noshin rightly said, if you, if you try to block that, you can actually limit the powers that we give to them to commit uh, wars. And that we see in Gaza, in Sudan, in Rwanda, and we know the US is the main, uh, the global weapon supplier, I mean, the main one. So we have to look at that. And, and that's where um, we will keep spreading the message on this. Adil, you, you told us uh, several times that US treasuries are the safest investment in the world, which, which seems we ought to be telling people uh, the opposite, although we don't want to lie to them. Can anything be done to make U.S. treasuries not be the safest investment in the world or to dissuade governments and individuals from buying them, even if they are so safe and reliable? You're muted, so if you could unmute. So there are two angles to that. The first angle being from a pure investment perspective, looking at the investment. So in, when you when when someone when somebody is investing in a sovereign bond or any bond for that matter, the first question is assessing the repayment capacity of the issuing entity. So from a pure investment perspective, this the first angle. The second angle is what these funds are being used for. And Part of these funds are being used to fund those very weapon manufacturers who are supplying weapons to Israel to commit that genocide. Now 
understanding how these dollars got into the US treasuries is also very important. So you see, the American economy is a net um, net importer, right? So um, by importing from other countries, they would actually, well, uh, send dollars to other countries. So other countries would have a pile of USD to invest. So the top investors would be Japan, China, the UK, and these dollars are actually reinvested in US treasuries. Being liquid, they can also be uh, collateralized, which means that they can be parked and they can lend against those investments and uh, being the safe um, status. So being uh, that being said, the USD is also the international reserve currency of the world. I mean, even uh, countries in Africa, they would import or trade in USD. They wouldn't trade in their own currency. So they would have to have that reserve. So inherently, the global uh, financial system is very re reliant on the USD, but that does not mean that the, these USDs uh, have to be invested at the federal level, knowing what they're funding. Now, back to the first level of questioning whether there's a, uh, well, the risk in, involved in the repayments of this debt. So we've seen a ballooning debt of the US federal go um, uh, a government. Um, and and we're not the only per the only people pointing that out. Actually, the Government Accountability Office has also issued reports questioning the the fiscal uh, su sustainability of that government polarized Congress as well. Uh, there's perpetually a debate over the debt ceiling, and also that interest payment has now well in interest servicing on U.S. Treasuries. The expenditure on repaying just the interest portion of that debt has exceeded the budget for the defense um, right now. So you ask yourself, the repayment capacity of the U.S. government is actually decreasing. And we feel that people are not paying attention. And it's almost heretical for people to call U.S. treasuries uh, dangerous or uh, risky investment. So. These are the questions that, 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 we're, that we're pushing forth. And again, um, it's not only, well, there are governments, uh, entities who are investing in them, but they're also the private sector. So if you hold a bank account, I mean, I hold a bank account in USD, and those USD are positively being, investing, uh, being invested in US treasuries. But I disagree personally to be funding a government that is just financing those weapon ma um, manufacturers to be engaging in a war I disagree with. So uh, I'd like to say something very, very key as well here um, when it comes to, uh, and I won't take too much of your, of, of your time because I really want uh, Zainab to be talking about the actions that have been taken so far. But I'd like to make this point. See, we operate in democracies, so we vote. We, we, when the time comes to vote for our parliamentaries or uh, deputies, um, we cost our vote, but we vote every day with our money. The, I, I mean, my thinking is the capitalistic system is actually the largest democracy we live in. We vote with our money. So every time we purchase a good or a service, we are agreeing to the supplier of the good or the service. And it's the same thing when we place money at a bank or at a pension fund or at an at, uh, asset manager, we are agreeing uh, uh, with the way that the manager is investing our money, uh, uh, the strategy or the um, investments that they are buying on our behalf. And if you think about it, those financial institutions, inherently their business model rely on the funds of the people. They don't have that uh, quantum of proprietary funds. They're using your money and my money. Now, for a democracy to function, the assumption is that the voters are informed. If that's, I think, why there's a lot of uh, emphasis on playing with information or how people get information so that they can influence the vote. But right. if we rely on the assumption that the capitalistic system is a democracy, so we vote with our money, we have to understand as well that the capital owners will only allocate capital to projects that earn them a return, to projects that uh, produces goods and services for which there's demand. So 
So there's there are a, a few a reasons big... why capitalism is not very democratic, including most people don't have any money to invest, and those who do have it in very unequal measure, and they have no idea what they're investing in, and for the most part, there isn't anything good to invest in, just degrees of evil. But uh, nonetheless, Zainab or Nashin, is there, is there a way for people who insist on investing money in something to invest it in something good and to avoid investing in governments uh, because there are there are ways to avoid investing in fossil fuels and avoid investing in weapons companies. Why can't there be uh, investment funds that avoid governments? You know, um, as you speak about this, um, since 2015, we've actually deployed $6.9 trillion on high polluting industry. I think the, the call to action is very similar to this. Um, and 2015 was the Paris Agreement, by the way, you were talking about fossil fuels, that's why I mentioned it. Um, and that said, I think there are, there are private equity funds that have uh, principle for responsible investing. And there is also the UN UNEP, you know, UNEP FI principle for responsible banking as well. That set those kind of standards. It's just that if you're looking at, um, I mean, some people do look at where those are being investors. I've invested the money. Um, you have investors now that are very much seeking ESG rating in to where they want to uh, their money to be going, and there are also uh, lots. I think exclusion list but the thing is there can be so many things out there it's just about how do you how do you actually enforce it and that's the disconnect a bit in what we're seeing today is that yeah there are so many things happening there are so many standards so many frameworks so many due diligence processes however we're not looking at uh how we're killing people how we're killing civilians how we're violating human rights and i think that's a big concern and and it doesn't really happen overnight. The whole point of, you know, spreading awareness is, you know, to have people start to realize that they have to look at where um, their money is going and start questioning because people are actually accountable to, and they, they are accountable, the leaders are, but we are also accountable to where our money is going. But it's a long fight, David, and it's not gonna start, it's stop here. Nasheen, do you want to add anything? I'd, I'd love to know how we can get the word out to people who are interested in advancing divestment that the world should be divesting from the U.S. government and its, and its war machine. David, now we, we want people to be aware where the money is actually referring to, especially all these people who are calling for ceasefire. Now that they have the information, they are very. They are. They have many options. One option is if they know that their pension money is being invested in U.S. treasuries and that fund is being used to fund the war, as the customers, they have full right to question this pension company to ask to divest from U.S. treasuries and propose alternatives. Of course, we know that there might be other investment that will not yield the same return as U.S. treasuries. But if you're genuinely concerned of what's happening, I believe that you will not really focus on the profit, but rather on the on the cause. So my message to all these people who are calling for ceasefire is that first, do the first step yourself. Question your pension companies, question your government, question your banks, check your investment portfolios. If you see that, your funds are flowing to the US treasuries, and now that you know it's also funding the war, as a client, you have the right to ask the dollars. It's not only in national, it's not only government who should act, but as individuals, if collect individually, everyone make an effort, it's going to be a collective movement. We, we have about five minutes left. I, I wonder what risks there are here, because when you divest from ExxonMobil or Lockheed Martin, typically nothing happens to you. But if a country divests from the United States, 
there's all kinds of political dangers there. The United States has a lot of economic power and and legal power in the United Nations and uh, power to influence international courts. Uh, I, I mean, what what sort of, of courage would be required for a country to say, we are going to divest from the Pentagon? Well, I'll uh, interject quickly here. Uh, we are also, well, see, we're not entirely saying, uh, well, maybe the Pentagon, with the way you say it, uh, definitely not um, keen on having funds channeled to weapons. But this said, we're not entirely calling uh, to divest from the United States. We're not even calling to divest from the US dollar. There are multiple USD investments that uh, an investor can make, uh, not necessarily at the federal level, but municipal or state level and also real assets. And um, But at the same time, I mean, our call is similar to the taxpayer. I mean, the taxpayer has to pay taxation. It's an obligation. If we need to invest in U.S. treasuries because we need to keep USD reserves, fine. That's the way the global financial system is structured. So be it. But that does not preclude the right to uh, uh, to the debt holders to be protesting about the debt dollars. So, like the tax uh, payers who protest about the debt, their, their tax dollars, we as creditors are protesting about about our debt dollars. So the pro the first level is 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 this, and we're not entirely uh, calling for a divestment, but we're saying, well, if you do not um, stop the funding of the genocide, we will find alternatives and there are alternatives out there. So it's not blackmail, it's the duty of every creditor to make sure that, that they are aware of where their funds are being used and to use that as a leverage, simply say. It. And uh, again, buying US treasuries is not an obligation, it's a, it's, it's a discretion, so you can choose not to renew your uh, US treasuries when it matures, or you can decide not to uh, invest further in it and decide to invest in other USD investments or even in the sovereign obligations uh, denominated in USD of other countries, which are right now, there are countries which are better rated credit wise than the United States. And maybe killing fewer people as well. Uh, we will have links up to more information at talkworldradio.org. We have been speaking with Nasheen Utin, Zainab Kodobakus, and Adil Abubakar about the world's investment in the U.S. war machinery. Thank you very, very much to all of you for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. Thank you, you David, and keep up the good work. You too. Thank you. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.